upon the Lord who is worth to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemy you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted Jesus Christ died for me and he took away my sin I will live with him for eternity you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted you know the Lord did it and blessed be the rock let God my salvation be exalted I will call upon the Lord good morning Let's praise God this morning. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my life, rebuild my faith, or oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, in your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, in peace restore. My cup is empty, refill and dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, renew my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, or oh, restore my soul. Would you bow with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful and humbled that you have loved us so much that you give us this opportunity to, to gather that you foresaw before the foundations of the earth to provide us salvation through your Son and the comfort of your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. As we gather here this morning, let us just continually open up our hearts and our minds to the love that you want to share with us, the, the community of family that you have established for us. And, Help us to embrace you, your son, the Holy Spirit, and each other as your adopted children. And Lord, we ask that you would look over Christians all over the world as we gather here and, and, and unite us in the blessings that you promise, and most of all, that hope of eternal life that we will share with you in heaven, dear Lord. Be with those here that are struggling, so many that are mentioned in the bulletin, dear Lord and bless them and touch them and, and use your power to heal them and to bring them back to a full measure of their health. Dear Lord, we pray, we ask that you be with the leadership here, the elders, the deacons, and the teachers as they lead this congregation in studying your word and garnering a greater appreciation for your magnificent, your love, and the, the plan that you have for us to, to build your kingdom here on earth and to share your kingdom in heaven. These things we pray through your son's name. 
Amen. You may be seated. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me. Well, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Well, it made my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just to talk with Jesus face, Lord, now let us have a little talk with you. Won't you let us save him? I know he will hear. And I will answer now when you feel as you are. So when you, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my best seems dream without a ray of cheap And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day Well, the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies But just a little talk with Jesus clears Lord, now let us have a little talk with Won't you let I know he will hear And I know he'll answer Now we feel As you are But if you, you will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning great is thy faithfulness the Lord is my portion says my soul therefore in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord says my portion says my soul. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You Hearts always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for, counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts has hopelessly lost our way. You 
His scalp was pierced by thorns, woven into a crown, pressed on his head. His face was swollen and beaten. He had knots on his head from being struck repeatedly with a rod. His back was raw and bleeding. His legs and his arms ached. His lungs burned as he tried to lift himself to catch a breath of fresh air to fill his lungs. His hands and feet were pierced with nails affixing him to a cross. On a Roman cross, Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth. And there, his human will to survive interfaced with his, the will of his spirit to complete the job that his father had sent him to do, to completely pour himself out as a sacrifice for all mankind for all time. It is there on that Roman cross that are my sins. It was there on that cross that my redemption was purchased. His blood cleanses me constantly. This is the time in our worship when we pause to remember, to reflect, to remember who we were, to think about what he did to make us not enemies, but sons and daughters of the king. The bread is his body, the fruit of the vine is the blood. Let us approach the throne of the Father with thankful and grateful hearts. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we stand before you sinners, clinging to the blood of Christ, so thankful, Lord, that we've been called out of the darkness, that our sin is no longer borne by us, sin that we were helpless to get rid of, Father, we were enemies of you, but you were never our enemy. You've always loved us, and you gently brought us to the cross where our sins have been nailed and forgiven. Lord, as we partake of these emblems, help us to think upon those things about that body that was beaten and naked, hanging on the cross, despised by men. But Lord, that is now our salvation, and we're so thankful and so grateful, and help us to partake in a manner that is pleasing to you. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen.
Let us continue to give thanks. Dear Lord, we, we have an image of what the cross was. And Lord, we were not there, and we don't realize how horrific, how graphic it was, how bloody it was, not only the pain and the anguish, but what Jesus bore on that cross exceeded anything that any other man could endure. Not the physical pain, Lord, but the spiritual pain. Lord, help us to, to look back at the cross, to be thankful for the blood, the blood that washes us and cleanses us as only His blood can. It's in His name we pray. Amen. We now have an opportunity to give back a portion of what we've been blessed. The funds that we give today, we don't know exactly where they'll end up. We don't know how God will give the increase to our blessing this morning of our gift. We never know who it will touch, where it will touch them, how far across the globe it will reach. But we pray that God will give the increase and that others will be blessed because we were willing to give this morning. Let us pray as we give thanks. Lord, we live in a country that has so many opportunities and so many blessings that most of the world doesn't enjoy. And throughout the history of our time, most people haven't enjoyed the, the level of quality of life that we have here today in America. And Lord, we pray that we'll take these blessings, that we will give them this morning, and that you will give the increase, that you will spread it abroad, that you will touch people 
right here in White County that you will touch people across the globe because we were willing to give. Thank you, Lord, for all that we have, and it is yours, Lord. Help us never to covet these things, never to treat them as if they were ours, but they are yours and we're your stewards. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I me your way, O oh Lord. I me your way, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, meet the shadow of your wings. Oh, I me your way, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, meet the shadow of your wing. Oh, give me your peace, O oh Lord. Safe in your dwelling place Safe in your dwelling place In the day of trouble Need the shadow of your wings Oh, hide me your way, O oh Lord Hide me your way, O oh I'm me away, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, need the shadow of your wings. Oh, I'm me away, O oh Lord. That's all to get stand. At this time, we'd like to dismiss to the nursery. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nation. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Offer of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. A 
author of salvation, he rose and God and the grave, Jesus God and the grave, Savior, he can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and God and the grave, Jesus God and the grave. Any church say it? Yeah. Maybe see it. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. This is the word of the Lord. Last Friday, as many of us were preparing to go back to school, Blake and Jessica Maynard were preparing for a funeral. In the early hours of August 16th, their only son, Cameron, ended his life in the bathroom of the family home. Cameron Drake Maynard, son, brother, grandson, great-grandson, nephew, cousin, and friend, passed away at his home August 16, 2019. He was 18 years old and a 2019 graduating senior of Texas High School. Born February the 8th, 2001, to Blake and Jessica Maynard, he had a quick wit and was known for his sweet smile. He had a passion for playing trumpet. His dedication and leadership left their mark on the Texas High Band. This talent, along with that of his fellow bandmates, helped win numerous marching band awards. Cameron was currently enrolled in Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia with plans to major in business marketing. Upon graduation, he had wanted to continue studies at Harding University in ministry. Cameron was a member of the Hampton Church of Christ. He will always be remembered for his talent for preaching to his home congregation even at an early age. This young man had an established book of sermons to use when called to spread the word. He was an active member of Hampton Youth Activities and traveled to Nicaragua to help Mission Para Cristo's efforts to share God's word and build churches there. He was also a part of Caruso, a training program through Harding University for young men headed towards the ministry. The Crusoe Experience is the ministry symposium that I direct at Harding. Cameron was a camper all five years he was eligible and was scheduled to return as a counselor next year. No one really knows why Cameron did what he did, but here's what we do know. He was doing something he probably shouldn't have been doing. His parents confronted him about it. An argument ensued, and Cameron took his own life. My initial thought was that in the heat of the moment, Cameron wanted to punish his parents in the most painful way imaginable. But I was talking to one of his good friends at the funeral, and the friend told me that Cameron wasn't mad 
at his parents. He was mad at himself. See, Cameron wanted to be a preacher more than just about anything. And whatever it was that he was doing, he thought it meant the end of that dream. And so because Cameron was disappointed in himself, and because he believed that what he had done would disappoint so many others, he took his own life. I also know that Cameron was a small boy. And because he was small, he was bullied mercilessly at school. He never believed he was big enough. He never believed he could be good enough. And he'd been open about that at Caruso. That's one of the things I will always remember about Cameron, his transparency. He was always ready and willing to talk about his struggles and to ask for help. And he was always ready and willing to help other people with similar struggles. And so I just, I don't understand. I don't understand. I was bullied too when I was younger. I have been the fat kid my entire life. But I've never thought about killing myself. The bullies, yes. But I never thought about harming myself. But the reality is that times have changed. Since the 1950s, the suicide rate for teenagers has increased 300%. In fact, just since the year 2000, the suicide rate has spiked 21%. And for mental health professionals, that is very alarming. Today, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the nation and in the state of Arkansas. In fact, in Arkansas, suicide is the ninth leading, no, sorry, suicide in Arkansas makes us the ninth most suicidal state in the nation. On average, one person dies by suicide every 14 hours in Arkansas. And why this is so significant for us is because among people who are um, 10 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death. And the question is why? Why would anybody do this? Well, here's what the statistics tell us. That as many as 10,000 suicides a year are drug or alcohol related. When people enter into chemically altered realities, they often end up doing things they would not normally do. 25 to 30 percent of those who commit suicide could be classified as mentally ill. And the vast majority of those suffer from anxiety and depression. It's no wonder that the suicide rates are increasing because the rates of anxiety and depression are increasing too. And I want to say something about that for just a moment. I've experienced anxiety and depression for my entire life, but mine always seems to be associated with me, what I'm doing at the time. When I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I get down on myself. But that's not the way it is for a lot of people. Others suffer anxiety and depression because of disease or chemical imbalances, and it is atrocious. Some of the things we say to these people, right? If you were stronger, this wouldn't be happening. If you just had more faith in God, this wouldn't be happening. I want you to think about how silly that is to someone who suffers from depression, that is, disease or imbalance related. You wouldn't say to a cancer patient, you know, if you had just been stronger, this wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't say that. Or if you just trusted God more, this, this wouldn't happen. But for some reason, when it comes to depression and anxiety, these are the kind of things we say. Shame on us. 40% of the time, 
and this is the majority of the time. When people commit suicide, it's because they are emotionally upset and not thinking clearly at that moment. According to Dr. Richard Seiden, an expert in suicide, the majority of suicides are crisis-oriented and acute in nature. That means they're impulsive, spur-of-the-moment decisions. That may be why more boys commit suicide than girls do. Girls attempt more often, boys succeed more often. It may be because of boys' impulsive nature. But it also means this, that if people could be helped to navigate the present temporary crisis, they would not be likely to hurt themselves. Some also use suicide as a means of manipulation or revenge. In other words, if you break up with me, then this is what I'm going to do. Others see it as a means of avoiding pain, the pain of loss or of embarrassment or guilt or consequences. For some, it's even viewed as the noble thing to do. A number of countries and a number of states in this country have passed right-to-die laws which claim to allow people to die with dignity to avoid another kind of pain. And so, in a lot of places, suicide has been romanticized or even glamorized. Google reports that in the months following Netflix's suicide show, 13 Reasons Why, there was a 26% increase in searches on how to commit suicide. It's been romanticized and glamorized, and the church has not kept up to speed. We have not talked about depression and anxiety and we have not talked about suicide. Dr. Dan Williams, who's Vice President for Church Relations at Harding and is also a licensed marriage and family therapist, says there may be some reasons for this. He talks about the finality of suicide. In other words, why talk about it? There's nothing left to talk about. That option's been taken out of our hands. There's nothing we can do right now. The people are gone and Many people think probably lost. We don't talk about it because there's nothing to talk about. He also talks about the anger of suicide. Very often when we hear that someone has taken their life, it's not sadness that we feel, it's anger. And we're embarrassed by that. I, I have to confess that when I got the call walking into the Benson Auditorium for convocation Friday morning that that had happened. It was not sadness that I felt, it was anger. Why didn't he call me? Why didn't he call one of us? What was he thinking? There is also a mythos about suicide that if we talk about it, it will inspire others to pursue it. But I think the biggest one that keeps those of us in the church from talking about it, and this is the one that I added to the list, and it's our theology. I have always lived in a church that views suicide as an unpardonable sin. We have a very biblical, very high view of life. We are made in the image of God for relationship with God. We are strictly forbidden from shedding blood and murdering. Our bodies are temples where the Holy Spirit dwells. And suicide violates all of those beliefs. Furthermore, many view suicide as the ultimate failure to trust God. 
and many others hold to the idea that any unconfessed sin or unrepented of sin is an unforgiven sin. We don't know what to say, and so we don't say anything. I know that in 15 years of preaching at Highway, I've never preached a sermon like this. I'm not even sure if I've ever mentioned suicide from the pulpit. And I don't know if I know what to say today, either. But I want to say something. I want to say something because I know that statistics being what they are, and the world being what it is, and our audience being what it is, there may very well be somebody in here today like Cameron. You are being bullied mercilessly. And not just in person, but on social media. Dr. Phil Thompson and I were talking about this on Friday, and when we were kids and being made fun of, we could at least go home and escape it. A lot of teenagers today live with it 24-7 on social media. You feel like you're never good enough, never pretty enough, never smart enough. You feel like no one can ever or will ever love you or forgive you. You feel like you've messed up beyond forgiveness or restoration. And what I want you to know about all of that this morning is that it is all a lie. You are believing a lie. If you are harming yourself or considering taking your own life, please listen to me. You are considering a permanent, irreversible solution to a temporary problem. More than 1,200 people have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, making it the world's leading suicide site. Only 26 have ever survived the jump, and the vast majority of those survivors report regretting their decision in midair. One of those survivors was Ken Baldwin. Baldwin was 28 and severely depressed on the August day in 1985 when he told his wife not to expect him home until late. I wanted to disappear, he said. So the Golden Gate was the spot. I'd heard that the water just kind of sweeps you under. On the bridge, Baldwin counted to 10 and stayed frozen. He counted to ten again, then vaulted over. I still see my hands coming off the railing, he said. As he crossed the bridge in flight, Baldwin recalls, I instantly realized that everything in my life that I thought was unfixable was totally fixable. Except for having just jumped. Don't pursue a permanent and irreversible solution to a temporary problem. There may very well be pain in your life. We are never promised a pain-free existence. Sometimes we bring that pain on ourselves when we act foolishly or stupidly. But sometimes that pain is caused by others through no fault of our own. And don't you know that Jesus understands that? Don't you know that that's what he experienced? That's why Peter writes this, that he committed no sin, 
Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Just hold on a little bit longer. Look to Jesus. Trust that there's coming a day when the God of the universe will right the wrongs and balance the accounts of history. It may be that your pain is the result of your own actions. And because of that, you've experienced loss or embarrassment or guilt or other consequences. Listen, I know that kind of pain is not enjoyable, but it can be helpful. It can be helpful, but you've got to allow the Spirit of God to do His refining, restoring work. The Apostle Paul had to get all over the Corinthians for some of the things that they were doing. He wrote them hard letters, and he made hard visits. But he writes this, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter has grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For, listen, godly grief produces repentance, that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Let me assure you this morning that you have not messed up beyond God's ability to save you. There is nothing you have done, I don't care what it is, that makes you unforgivable or unacceptable to God or to us. You are made in His image for relationship with Him and with us, and your blood doesn't need to be shed because His has. His has so that you and that we can live. And the answer to your pain is not to end your life. It is to allow God to mend your life. And church, we have a role to play in all of this too. I mentioned the Golden Gate Bridge. Dr. Jerome Motto was a psychiatrist in the Bay Area in the 60s and 70s. A lot of his patients committed suicide on the bridge. But he said one really stands out and still haunts him to this day. He writes of going into this young man's very bare apartment in the days following his jump from the bridge. And he found this note. I'm going to walk to the bridge. If one person smiles at me on the way, I will not jump. Church, we are surrounded by hurting people who are hanging on by a thread. And they need you and me to be the church. They need you and me to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want any of them to perish, and neither should we. We should love them and serve them the way He would. We must give them reason to hope the way He would. And so I'm begging you to go find those people this week. They're the people who sit alone in the lunchroom. They're the people who withdraw from the workroom. Go find these people and be Jesus to them. Because you just might save their lives or their souls. I'm going to close with a word for both the living and the dead. 
I began this sermon with a word from 1 Kings 15. A weird text. I know. But go with me. It's a word about Asa, king of Judah. And the historian records, although he did not remove the high places, which is a word about idolatry, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. As I stood in front of that family on Tuesday thinking of what to say, I felt like I needed to address the elephant in the room, which was this godly kid who wanted to preach, took his own life. And how should we process that? And I found this text. Asa is remembered as a good king. Asa did some good things in his reign over God's people. He removed a lot of the pagan idols and restored the worship of the true God of Israel. But in his story in Kings, there is more space in the text devoted to his failures than to his successes. Asa didn't remove all the idols. Asa entered into a treaty with a pagan king because he did not trust God. Asa brutally oppressed his people. And Asa, even at the end of his life when he was afflicted with what the writer calls a disease of the feet, did not turn to God to heal him. But do you see what the Bible says about Asa? Do you see the epitaph that God writes over his life? Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. And, and lest you think that is a, an error, listen to the summary of King David's life just a few verses earlier. David, who stole a man's wife and then murdered her husband to cover up his sin, among other things. Just a few verses earlier, the historian writes, For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life except for that elephant in the room. Except for that case involving Uriah the Hittite. I don't know exactly what to make of these verses. I don't know exactly how much to read into them. But I do know this. That if God judges me for how I acted on the worst day of my life, I am doomed. And so are you. But I have reason to believe that that's not what God does. It's not what He did with Asa. It's not what He did with David. It is not what He did with, and the list of names could go on and on. Because God's grace is deep. And his mercy is wide. And he specializes in doing the impossible. If you feel like this morning you are in an impossible situation, I beg you, don't do it. Let God have it. Let the Father forgive you. Let the Son wash you. Let the Spirit empower you and let the church bear your burden. This auditorium is filled with people who would love to serve you. Ministers, elders, counselors, medical professionals. 
they'll be stationed here, they'll be in the back, they'll be at the exits, and if you need to say something, do it now while we stand and sing. I care not to day what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is pain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all and feel the world. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arrive, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast sky. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all harm, safe and in sheltering Living by faith and feel no 